That's the end of Northern Ireland questions. We now come to questions to the Prime Minister. I will first call the Prime Minister to answer the engagement question, and then I will then call Ronnie Cohen to ask his supplementary virtually. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know that the whole House will want to join me in sending our very best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen on her 95th birthday. Mr Speaker, last night's verdict in Minneapolis delivered justice for the family and friends of George Floyd, and I know that the thoughts of the whole House remain with them. Mr Speaker, I welcome the decision taken by the six English football teams not to join the European Super League. The announcement was the right result for football fans, for clubs and for communities across the country. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Let's go to Ronnie Cowan. Ronnie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. May I extend my good wishes to the Queen today in what must be difficult times. I hope she finds she is surrounded by friends and family and she can find it within herself to take some time to celebrate her 95th birthday. I know the Prime Minister is not a supporter of basic income, but given that Hull, Belfast, Norwich, Leeds, Lambeth, Guildford, Swansea and Glasgow, along with 24 other councils around the United Kingdom, have expressed a desire to run pilot schemes which will enhance all our knowledge of the pros and the cons, will the Prime Minister consider facilitating any pilot projects in the United Kingdom? And has the UK government considered any research into basic income? And if so, what? Prime Minister. I I'm grateful to the uh, Honourable Member for his support for a, a UK-wide proposal. And uh, I, I, I trust he understands the irony of that uh, when you consider, Mr Speaker, that his party, as I understand it, is still hell-bent on calling a, an irresponsible uh, referendum on breaking up uh, the United Kingdom. Dr Luke Evans. Luke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And as we come out of lockdown and look to the summer, many people are going to be concerned about their body image. And we know that there are 1.25 million people who suffer with eating disorders and 1 million people using steroids, and that number is getting worse. The Women and Equalities Committee two weeks ago released a report on body image, and they concluded that, I quote, doctored photos promoting unachievable body images were having a detrimental impact. So would the Prime Minister consider all options, including labelling digitally altered images, to help deal with the issues raised of body image? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is raising a uh, very important point and uh, I, I think he and the whole House are aware of the pressure that young people in particular uh, can feel a, as a result of, uh, of, of the abducted images and as part of the online advertising, the consultation on online advertising uh, program, uh, we will look at what we can do and I know that we will be responding to the Select Committee's report uh, in due course. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in wishing Her Majesty a very happy birthday? The last few weeks have been a time of incredible personal anguish, and we all send Her Majesty and the Royal Family our very best wishes. Can I also join the Prime Minister in his comments about the verdict in the George Floyd case, uh, justice in that case? And even as an, as an Arsenal season ticket holder, can I uh, join him in his comments about the European Super League, which would have destroyed football, and we now need to get on with the other changes that are necessary. Uh, and finally, Mr Speaker, can I also send my condolences to the family of Frank Judd, um, who died earlier this week. Frank was a much-loved member of this House and the other place for many decades, and highly respected as a Labour minister, a great internationalist, and campaigner for peace and human rights, and uh, he will be sadly missed. What does the Prime Minister think is the right thing to do if he receives a text message from a billionaire Conservative supporter asking him to fix tax rules? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, first of all, I echo uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman's remarks about Frank Judd. And uh, can I say to him, uh, in response to his question, uh, that if he's referring to uh, the request from James Dyson, I make absolutely no apology at all. 
Mr Speaker, for shifting heaven and earth and doing everything I possibly could, I think any uh, Prime Minister would in uh, those circumstances, uh, to secure ventilators uh, for the people of this country and to save lives and to roll out a ventilator procurement uh, which the uh, Labour-controlled uh, Public account Accounts Committee themselves uh, said was a benchmark uh, for procurement. Mr Speaker, let's be clear what these texts show. The Prime Minister was lobbied by a wealthy businessman and a close friend for a change in the tax rules. Tax rules. The Prime Minister responded, I'll fix it. Then, after a discussion with the Chancellor, who everybody seems to be lobbying these days, the Prime Minister texted his friend to say, it's fixed. How many other people with the Prime Minister's personal number has he given preferential treatment to? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I, re I recall the right honourable gentleman uh, at the time uh, saying that we should do everything uh, that we could to uh, get more ventilators and, and indeed uh, he, he congratulated the, the rollout of the ventilator. He said that, he said that well done to everybody involved uh, for the ventilator challenge. And I just remind the House what we were facing in March last year. Mr. Speaker, which was that we had a new virus which was capable uh, of killing people in ways that we didn't understand. The only way to help them uh, in extremis was to intubate them and put them on ventilation. We had 9,000 ventilators in this country, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we secured 22,000 as a result of that ventilator challenge. I think it was entirely the right thing to do to work with all potential, all potential makers of ventilators at, at that time, Mr. Speaker. And by the way, uh, so does the former leader of the Labour Party, a man to whom I think he should listen, uh, Tony Blair. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm surprised the Prime Minister brings up former leaders, since it's his former leader, his friend, I think, Dave, who's at the heart of uh, much of this. And I acknowledge thousands of businesses stepped up during the pandemic. That was a good thing, and we celebrate that. The difference is, they didn't all have the chance to text the Prime Minister Ask him to fix the tax situation in exchange for doing that. That's the difference. At the heart of this scandal are people's jobs and wasted taxpayers' money. Take, for example, take for example the thousands of jobs at Liberty Steel that are on the line in Hartlepool, in Rotherham and elsewhere, following the collapse of Greensill Capital. The Prime Minister hasn't fixed that. In fact, he's done nothing to help steel workers. Is it now, quite literally, one rule for those that have got the Prime Minister's phone number, another for everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, he calls it a scandal. He voted uh, for the changes uh, that we brought in. Uh, our ventilator, he called our ventilator challenge an outstanding success, and I think he was completely right. Uh, this is a government that gets on and uh, delivers for people uh, in distress and, and delivers for the, on the people's priorities. And yes, uh, yes, of course, uh, I'm, I'm concerned for the families of steel workers uh, up, and down the, up and down the country. That's why the business secretary has been meeting with uh, the unions and with the management of Liberty Steel repeatedly over the last few days. But we believe in British Steel, uh, Mr Speaker. It was under, under the Labour, uh, last Labour government that jobs in steel fell by more than 50% and output fell by more than 50%. We've now got a 5 million tonne pipeline of British steel uh, with our massive infrastructure investments and we intend to use our new freedoms under Brexit to make sure that procurement goes to British companies, Mr Speaker. Yes, when he says we believe in British steel, well, do something. I have to say to the Prime Minister, steel workers waking up this morning will find it deeply offensive to hear the Prime Minister boasting to his friends that He's the first Lord of the Treasury, yeah. and we can give you the backing we need. Yeah. He won't give the steelworkers the backing that they need. Right, Mr Speaker, this shows once again that favours, privileged access, tax breaks for mates, they're the, now, they're the main currency of this Conservative government. And if that's not the case, Prime Minister, can the Prime Minister tell me if one of the three million self-employed people who've been excluded from government support for over a year and now face bankruptcy, if they text the Prime Minister to ask for a tax break so they can survive, 
Would he change the rules for them too? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, we've given uh, this government, I should say, has uh, supported the self-employed with more than £14 billion uh, throughout the pandemic. And, uh, we, and that's a part of uh, a, a vast package uh, of support for, uh, for jobs and livelihoods across the country. We continue to do everything it takes. And I think that he should take back what he said about the ventilator challenge. Uh, he attacks the ventil cha ventilator challenge now. Our efforts, our efforts to get more ventilators uh, at a very, very difficult time uh, for this country. In, in the same way, Mr Speaker, by the way, in which he opportunistically attacked uh, the vaccine task force at a critical moment, uh, which, he will, which he will recall. Mr Speaker, we take the tough decisions that are necessary to protect the people of this country and get things done. Mr Speaker, if I had to correct the Prime Minister for everything he gets wrong, I'd be here all day. I take it, I take it that's a no as an answer to the question in relation to the three million. And there we have it. An open door, but for those with the Prime Minister's number, a closed door to the three million. What this shows once again is the extent of the sleaze and cronyism that's at the heart of his Conservative government. Let me try another way, Prime Minister. Let me try another way. If an NHS nurse, if an NHS nurse, Prime Minister, who's been working on the front line during the pandemic, had the Prime Minister's phone number, would they get the pay rise they so obviously deserve? Mr. Minister. Speaker, I'm proud of what this government has done to support the NHS throughout the pandemic uh, with record investments and uh, with another £92 billion that we've put in uh, to support the NHS throughout the pandemic. And what we're doing to help nurses, as he knows, is last year putting in the bursary of £5,000 plus the £3,000 on top to help them with training and the costs of childcare, a 12.8% 12 increase on starting salary uh, just uh, in the last uh, couple of years, Mr Speaker. And uh, above all, this is the government that is helping nurses and helping the profession by recruiting more than ever before. And uh, there, are gonna, there are already 50,000 more people in the NHS this year than there were last year, Mr Speaker, and 10,600 more nurses. That's what I'd say uh, to many of the nurses that I've talked to in the last uh, few days and weeks, and we will continue to back them to the hilt. Yes, sir. If the Prime Minister had been talking to the NHS frontline, he'd know just how insulted they are by his pay cut after everything they put in in the last year. They didn't get a text from the Prime Minister, they got a kick in the teeth. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there's a pattern to this government. The Prime Minister is fixing tax breaks for his friends. The Chancellor is pushing the Treasury to help Lex Greensill. The Health Secretary is meeting Greensill for drinks. And David Cameron is texting anybody who will reply. <laughs> every day, every day, there are new allegations about this Conservative government. Dodgy PPE deals, tax breaks for their mates. The Health Secretary owns shares in a company delivering NHS services. Sleaze, sleaze, sleaze. And it's all on his watch. With this scandal now firmly centred on him, how on earth does he expect people to believe that he is the person to clean this mess up? Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because it, this, I'll tell you why uh, this government is, is doing the right thing at the right time. Because the difference between uh, us and the Labour Party is, is I'm afraid, uh, staringly obvious. And we get on. Uh, we're taking the tough decisions uh, to protect the people of this country and to take our country forward. Uniting a level. We, we take the tough decisions to procure thousands, tens of thousands of ventilators in record time, which apparently he now opposes. Uh, we, we, put, we put forward tougher sentences uh, for rapists uh, and violent criminals, Mr Speaker, which he then opposes on a three-line whip, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and we stick up, we take tough decisions to stick up for the fans to stick up for the fans of our national game. Captain Hindsight snipes continually from the sidelines. This government gets on with delivering on the people's priorities, Mr Speaker. Philip Davis.